Hey everyone, my name is Tim, and this is So You Want Me to Believe. Happy Easter Sunday if you celebrate. My family usually does a big lunch and an Easter egg hunt for the kids every year, but I think the Easter Bunny is practicing social distancing this year too. It's a weird way to spend a holiday you're used to sharing with your friends and family, but as I've said repeatedly before, it's important to stay inside right now so we can put an end to this virus. In other news, I've gotten some pretty great feedback from a few people recently on the show. I'm so glad people are liking what I'm doing. Podcasting is a fun hobby that I get to share with the world, so it makes me happy that it's being received so well. If anyone else would like to give me some feedback on the show, please feel free. You can send it to me in an email at SYWMTBpod at gmail.com. Or you can send me a message on any one of my social media platforms, whatever's easiest for you. I love hearing from you guys, so keep it coming. If you don't already know, Patreon is an online membership platform that provides business tools for creators to run a subscription content service. It allows subscribers or patrons to help creators to continue producing content while offering exclusive rewards and perks for their support. The link to my Patreon page is www.patreon.com slash SYWMTBpod. There are three tiers, each with their own set of incentives. If you'd like to check those out, follow that link to the page and they're listed there for you. If you do like the show, please consider subscribing to the Patreon. Everyone who subscribes not only gets exclusive content, but it goes a long way in helping me produce the show. Any support is greatly appreciated. I also want to plug Buzzsprout. I don't have enough of a listener base to get an actual sponsor, so to be clear, Buzzsprout is not sponsoring the show. But they are a great service that offers content creators affiliate partnerships, so I do want you to know about them. Buzzsprout is a podcast hosting service that allows creators to put the content they make out into the world. If you've ever been interested in starting your own podcast, like I'm doing now, Buzzsprout is an excellent resource to help you achieve that goal. Following the link in the show notes lets Buzzsprout know I sent you, gets you a $20 Amazon gift card if you sign up for a paid plan, and helps support the show. I use Buzzsprout, and it's really helped make putting out the podcast an easy task. Buzzsprout offers a lot of useful and convenient features, like tons of guides to help you find the right equipment at the right price, getting your show listed in every major podcast platform, and by providing a great-looking podcast website that includes audio players that you can drop into other websites, detailed analytics to see how people are listening, tools to promote your episodes, and more. Podcasting isn't hard when you have the right partners. The team at Buzzsprout is passionate about helping you succeed. So join over 100,000 podcasters already using Buzzsprout to get their message out to the world. For this week's weird history fact, I actually have a couple things I want to talk about, both relating to the first president of the United States, George Washington. Now, normally I'd give you a little background on the subject I'm introducing you to, but I don't think George Washington is a name people aren't going to recognize, so I don't find it necessary to go into that detail. However, because Washington is such a well-known figure, there are stories about his life that people still spread today, even though they aren't actually true. The most famous of these stories is the cherry tree legend. Everyone's heard the story of a young George Washington chopping down his father's cherry tree, and when confronted about it, he says, I cannot tell a lie, I did cut it with my hatchet. Well, that never happened. The most famous fun fact about the life of George Washington is actually just a story made up by a man named Mason Locke Weems, hoping to sell books about Washington's life post-mortem. Another popular belief about old George is that he wore a set of dentures that contained wooden teeth. But again, not true. Full wooden dentures were, in fact, a real thing, having been invented in Japan sometime in the 16th century, although they weren't commonly used. But Washington's teeth were not wooden. In fact, he had multiple sets of dentures made of a variety of different things, but none of them would. Some of the materials used to build a set of Washington's dentures were ivory, gold, and lead. But some were also made up of real human teeth bought from slave owners who pulled them from the mouths of their slaves, which is just horrendous to even think about. The myth that George Washington had wooden teeth does not have a clear origin, but there is a likely explanation. Some believe that Washington's dentist, John Greenwood, crafted him a set of dentures made entirely from ivory, which stained over time. The stained ivory could have given off an appearance of stained wood, which could have misled people to believe that's what they were actually made from. 
Those are just a couple of facts about George Washington's life that I thought were interesting enough to include here, but what I really want to talk about is something that happened to George Washington after his death, and this is something you probably have not heard about. George Washington died on December 14, 1979. He passed from complications due to a throat infection called epiglottitis, which he had only contracted two days prior. Again, science and medicine were not very evolved in Washington's time. Also, because of that, there was a huge concern over burying people alive after they appeared to have died. It was unfortunately not something that people blew out of proportion either, as it was actually a really common occurrence. But there was obviously some confusion as to what was actually happening here. It was a popular belief that these people had actually died, but were then returning from the dead. In all actuality, we know now that's not the case, nor is it even a possibility. But with a limited understanding of science, this was the best explanation they could provide. And I don't mean it was one of those crackpot amateur expert opinions either. This was something the doctors believed too. In fact, one of Washington's close friends, Dr. William Thornton, who was a prominent physician in his time, believed that this was the case. And with George Washington being the important man that he was, Dr. Thornton thought he would use his professional skills to help aid Washington in his journey back to life. Essentially, George Washington would be a real Frankenstein monster, or Thornton monster, I suppose. Washington passed in December, so by the time Dr. Thornton had access to his body, he was frozen solid. Now, I know that would be the first clue for us that there's no coming back from this, but remember, it's 1799 and they don't know better. So having observed a frozen body, Dr. Thornton proposed that he be thawed in cold water, then wrapped in blankets, increasingly layering them and adding friction to his body until he had warmed up. Then, he wanted to give Washington a tracheotomy in order to fill his lungs with air, and finally, he wanted to give him a blood transfusion using the blood from a lamb. He believed all of this would bring Washington back to life. He reasoned this by explaining that Washington had died from a loss of blood and a want for air, but restoring the heat that had been lost from the body would reactivate blood vessels, and at the same time he could open a passage to the lungs by the trachea, inflating them with air to produce an artificial respiration. And, once he received the blood transfusion, Dr. Thornton believed he would be back in perfect condition and this would bring him back to life. His ideas were rejected by the family, though, so none of this was ever actually performed on Washington's body. But not because they believed Dr. Thornton was insane and that this would have been a crazy science experiment that couldn't possibly provide the desired outcome. Instead, they reasoned that it wasn't their place to play God and that Washington had passed away, so it wasn't right to attempt to bring him back from the dead. For this week's podcast recommendation, I want to plug the Great Unsolved Podcast. This show is hosted by Alexis, who also hosts another show called Gone in an Instant. This podcast focuses around unsolved murders and missing persons cases, and the stories she tells are fascinating. This is one of my new favorite podcasts, as the stories are incredibly well-researched, and Alexis makes it clear that her purpose for the show is to provide some much-needed exposure to the cases, which is necessary for them to ever be solved and for families to get some closure and justice. Here's a short clip of the most recent episode in which Alexis discusses the murders of Annette Schnee and Barbara Burns Oberholzer. Hamilton stated that he had found Barbara's driver's license in his yard. Hamilton's home was about 10 or 11 miles northeast of Fairplay, which was not in the direction Barbara would have been going to get home. Later searches would reveal that most of her purse contents were strewn among his yard. The recovery of the license would cause friends and family of Barbara's to go search along the Route 285. If you like what you heard in that clip, there's only more great content where that came from. You can find the link tree for her show in my show notes. Again, that's the Great Unsolved Podcast. Check it out. Before I get into this week's episode, I have one more thing I want to plug for you. If you're a filmmaker, screenwriter, musician, podcaster, or any other type of content creator, then you know that exposure is one of the most important and difficult things to come by. One of the best ways for an artist to gain exposure is through film festivals, but those are generally a huge pain and the events fail to invite influential viewers or fill screenings. The creators of the Boston Collective Film Festival recognize these challenges and have organized a unique digital event that overcomes these obstacles. For four years running, the Boston Collective Film Festival has provided content creators with an opportunity to be featured in an exclusive capacity that no other festival offers. This year, the Boston Film Festival has teamed up with YouTube star ASMR Kitten, and the winners of the event will have their content reviewed in one of her videos. 
This is a huge opportunity for some exposure as ASMR Kitten currently has over 30,000 subscribers. That's a big audience and one that we all wish we had for ourselves. If you're interested in entering the festival and want to learn more about this one-of-a-kind event, check out their website at filmfreeway.com slash Boston. And just for my listeners, if you have any content you'd like to enter into the festival, you can use code BELIEVEPOD for 10% off the entrance fees. I'll post a link to the site in the show notes, as well as a link to ASMR Kitten's channel if you want to check her out as well. Again, this is labeled as a film festival, but there are categories for all kinds of media. So check it out and use code BELIEVEPOD for 10% off your entry fees. This week I want to talk about something a little bit different. This technically doesn't fall into a paranormal or true crime category, but I guess you could say it's a little bit of weird history and conspiracy all rolled into one. Now, I'm not a huge fan of cryptids. There are a couple I find interesting, but for the most part, they're just not that interesting to me. So I likely won't ever discuss cryptids, and I'm not heading down that path with this story. But this isn't cryptids. This is aliens. Whether you want to believe it or not, there is absolutely no way you can convince me that the planet Earth is the only planet in any solar system that contains sentient life. I mean, I'm not a scientist or anything, but come on. Somewhere out in space is another floating rock with little beings fighting each other and destroying their planet. So yes, I firmly believe that aliens exist. Now, I don't want to say that they're the classic gray-skinned, big-eyed creatures like the ones described in the story, but I'm sure there's something out there. We don't have the technology to travel to Mars, let alone another galaxy completely, so I don't know how much I believe that aliens have ever been to Earth, or have even made some sort of remote contact with humans. But who knows, maybe we don't have that technology, but they do. So, for this week's episode, I want to talk about the original and probably most famous alien abduction story, the Betty and Barney Hill incident. If you're an alien enthusiast, you've probably heard of this story, and that's because a lot of what Betty and Barney claim can actually be corroborated. And if you're vaguely familiar with the names involved, you may be more familiar with the declassified case files of Project Blue Book that talk about this, which was also covered on the History Channel through a show of the same name. I hear that the show is pretty good, but I don't have cable, and it's not on any of the streaming services I subscribe to, and I'm not about to buy a season of the show to do some research for a free podcast. Unless y'all want to start contributing to the Patreon, that is, uh, patreon.com slash SYWMTBpod, then I'm going to stick with my free resources. So I haven't seen the show, but there are still some pretty interesting reads out there on the internet for free. For this episode, I listened to the Skeptoid podcast, an article on the History Channel's website by Linda Lucina, and a live science article by Benjamin Bradford. I'll put links in the show notes to each of those articles if you'd like to check them out. Betty and Barney Hill were a middle-aged interracial couple who lived in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Normally, I wouldn't include the fact that they were interracial, but this story takes place in the 60s, so it was still pretty uncommon and looked down upon in the United States. I also point this out because if any of you are fans of American Horror Story, you might remember in Asylum when there were aliens involved for like half a second and then they just kind of forget about them for the rest of the season. Kit and Alma Walker, portrayed by Evan Peters and Brittany Oldford respectively, were also an interracial couple who were impacted by aliens. These characters were actually inspired by Betty and Barney Hill. Despite the interracial thing, the Hills led pretty average lives. Barney worked for the U.S. Postal Service, and Betty was a social worker. They were active in their local church, and they were involved in some social organizations as well, such as the NAACP and the United States Commission on Civil Rights. In September of 1961, the Hills took a vacation to Canada to visit Niagara Falls and Montreal. I'm not exactly sure where they were driving from on their way home to Portsmouth, but around 10.30 p.m. on September 19th, Betty and Barney Hill would experience something that would not only affect them for the rest of their lives, but would shape the folklore surrounding alien abductions. Obviously, the purpose of this trip isn't super important, but I was curious to see how long their drive home would have been, and surprisingly, I couldn't find a lot of information about exactly where they were coming from. I'm assuming they started at Niagara Falls, which is about eight hours from Portsmouth, and ended their vacation in Montreal, which is about five hours from Portsmouth. That just seemed like the logical path to me, but I don't really know where they were coming from. But I thought that would be important information, given the couple's story. It's probably in that show I refused to buy, but I couldn't find it online. Anyway, the Hills and their dog, Delcy, were driving back home from their vacation. At some point after the couple had re-entered the limits of New Hampshire, Betty saw what she thought may have been a shooting star. But as she continued to watch the light in the sky, she noticed that it wasn't going in the right direction to be a shooting star, nor was it disappearing. It also seemed to be growing bigger and brighter, which made Betty somewhat curious. 
Betty wanted to take a closer look at whatever this was through some binoculars, so she convinced Barney to pull over, which he did, just south of the unincorporated village of Twin Mountain. When they stopped, they brought Delcy out to do her business, and Betty looked up at the sky to observe the strange light. What she saw was an odd-shaped craft that appeared to have flashing, multicolored lights traveling across the face of the moon. She was convinced that this was a UFO. Barney, on the other hand, was a little more skeptical, initially believing it was a commercial airplane traveling towards Vermont. But upon further investigation, he realized that, without appearing to have even turned, the craft was now heading directly towards them. Once he came to the realization that this was, in fact, not an airplane, they quickly got back in the car and started driving away, heading towards Franconia Notch, which is a major yet narrow mountain passage through the White Mountains. I don't know if this was on their intended path or if they chose to go this way to kind of try and hide in the mountains, but if their plan was to hide, it didn't work. The hill said that they kept driving but moving very slowly in order to keep an eye on the unknown object as it appeared to be following them and getting even closer. From what Betty could observe, she estimated that the craft was about 100 feet long and appeared to be pancake flat and rotating. It began rapidly descending towards the car, which forced Bernie to slam on the brakes and stop the car in the middle of Route 3, just about a mile south of Indian Head, New Hampshire. They claimed that the huge craft silently hovered about 90 feet above them and completely obstructed the view out of the car's windshield. With his pistol in his pocket, Barney got out of the car and moved closer to the craft. He looked up at it through the binoculars and claimed to see somewhere between 8 and 11 humanoid-type creatures staring at him through the windows of the craft. The figures then left the windows, heading towards what looked like a panel to exit the craft. He could now see red lights coming from what looked like wings on either side of the craft and described a long structure descending from the bottom. Horrified, Barney ran back to the car and told Betty, they're going to capture us, before speeding off. The craft once again shifted directly above them, and Betty stuck her head out the window and looked up at the craft. They immediately started hearing loud buzzing and beeping noises and started feeling odd. The next thing either one of them knew, they were about 35 miles down the road, and about two hours had elapsed, but they had no memory of what had happened to them between the time they heard the beeping and buzzing and when they regained consciousness. When the couple got home around dawn the next morning, they felt unusually dirty and were exerting some strange impulses they couldn't explain. For instance, Betty insisted that her luggage be kept near the back door rather than brought back into the house. She didn't know why, but that's where she wanted her luggage to be. Barney said he was compelled to examine his genitals in the bathroom once they got home, but he couldn't explain why and didn't find anything out of the ordinary. Both also took long, thorough showers to rid themselves of any possible contamination, then sat down and drew pictures to recreate the events that they could remember from that night. But past the impulses, there were also some physical abnormalities they couldn't quite explain. Both of them were wearing watches at the time of the occurrence, and both watches seemed to stop working at the same time. Neither of them would work ever again. Barney also said that the leather strap around the binoculars they were using was torn, but he did not recall that happening. He also had scuffs and scrapes on the toes of his dress shoes, and Betty claimed that the dress she was wearing that night had been ripped and was damaged beyond repair. They also both described circles that had appeared on the trunk of their car. I don't really know what that means, if that means like a dent or a change in color, or if it was some kind of foreign object, but either way, they said that they had experimented on them with compasses, and claimed that they interfered with the magnetic pole on the compass when it was brought near to them. Betty sort of started to obsess over the incident, which, I mean, wouldn't you? Barney didn't seem to be quite as overcome by the experience, but he still firmly believed what happened to them was real. Although they couldn't recall much of that time, the couple were interviewed by government agencies and retold many of the details they had been able to hang on to. Eventually, the couple agreed to be hypnotized in an attempt to pull forward some of those memories that had been repressed. They were hypnotized a number of times and separately so that they couldn't influence each other's recollection. During Barney sessions, he claimed that immediately after the buzzing, he felt compelled to drive into the woods where he saw six of the humanoid creatures standing before him. The clear leader of the group told him not to be scared of them, but not using words, like they somehow told this to him through telepathy. Once aboard the craft, Barney and Betty were separated, and Barney was taken to a room and told to lie down on a small exam table. He claimed that a cup had been placed over his genitals that he believed had somehow extracted a sperm sample, he had been briefly anally probed, and the creatures were giving him an overall physical examination. Through sheer terror, though, Barney kept his eyes closed for a majority of the exam, so the story he provides does not come with a lot of detail. 
Betty, on the other hand, had given a pretty detailed description. While most aspects of Betty's recollection were similar to those Barney described, Betty provided further details that included a personal interaction with one of the beings. She claimed that the examiner had told her that he would be conducting a few tests to learn about their species and placed her on a chair under a bright light. She says he cut off a lock of her hair, trimmed her fingernails to observe the trimmings, and gave a physical examination of her eyes, ears, mouth, teeth, throat, and hands. Then he used what looked like a letter opener to cut off a small piece of her skin for examination and placed it on top of what looked like cellophane. Then, in order to test her nervous system, the being shoved a long needle into her belly button. She said this caused her agonizing pain, but then the being waved his hands in front of her face and the pain just went away. When the being conducting the exam left the room, she engaged the leader of the group in conversation. She claimed that she picked up a book that contained rows of strange symbols. She also claims the leader told her she could take it home with her, later changing his mind as she was not meant to remember her experience there. She then claimed that after asking where they had come from, the being would show her a star map that appeared to be like some sort of hologram that showed a trade triangle and path of travel. Now, obviously the story gained a lot of attention, and while some people didn't believe it to be true, including the doctor who conducted the hypnosis sessions, a lot of people believed it to be factual, garnering a lot of fame for Betty and Barney Hill. For a long time, there was little criticism of the stories they told, and the Air Force was even able to corroborate their claims through two separate UFO reports using data from two different Air Force installations nearby. There seemed to be quite a lot of validity to the Hill's claims. But through the years, people have begun to doubt Betty and Barney's stories. And for a few reasons. The most important piece of evidence pointing to the story possibly being made up were from the hypnosis sessions themselves. Prior to the hypnosis pulling these supposed memories forward, Betty claimed to be having wild and vivid dreams about that night. She began writing them down and would later give them to the doctor putting them under hypnosis. The doctor claimed that a majority of what Betty came up with under hypnosis were a match to the descriptions of her dreams, and for the most part, Barney's details seemed to match hers. Therefore, the doctor concluded that the so-called memories pulled out of hypnosis was most likely just a recollection of the dreams she was having, and while obsessing over that night, she probably talked Barney's ear off about them, and that's why his account was a match to hers, but with fewer details. There's also the visual account of the creatures that seemed to change, which I would think would be one of the most important aspects of the memory from that night. Betty initially described the men as short guys with weird noses, but being mostly similar to humans. Barney's description, though, was quite different. His description of the beings were that they were skinny figures with gray skin, large bald heads, and huge black eyes. This is the classic description of an alien I referred to earlier, similar to the alien emoji on your phone. The Skeptoid podcast I used as a resource for this episode has a really interesting theory as to why that is. Twelve days prior to the hypnosis sessions, the TV show The Outer Limits aired an episode titled The Bolero Shield, which featured an alien matching the description Barney gave of the creatures. The Hills claimed they had never seen the show and weren't even aware of it. But there was also an episode of The Twilight Zone called Hocus Pocus and Frisbee that aired in 1962, which also featured aliens that may have even been a better match to their claims, and I don't believe they were ever questioned about that episode. But the most important factor of all is Betty's obsession over the event. Because, in fact, it did not appear that Betty was just obsessed with that night in particular, but with UFOs in general even prior to the events of that night in 1961. According to her, her sister was also witness to a UFO sighting several years prior, and Betty herself had a keen interest in aliens speaking about them constantly. And after the supposed abduction, Betty claimed they had seen the lights in the sky hundreds more times, though they were never abducted again. It also seems that the corroborated reports by the Air Force actually weren't corroborated at all. There were reports from that night, but the details just don't align with the stories told by the Hills. And the physical evidence described by the Hills also seems to be fabricated. None of it could provide proof of any extraterrestrial beings, even if it were true. And again, the Skeptoid podcast brings up a good point about Barney's description of looking up into the object in his binoculars and seeing humanoid creatures staring down at him through a row of windows in a long, flat craft. After some research, it seems that Barry was probably actually looking at the Cannon Mountain aerial tramway, which would match both his description and the drawings he made. So that is all I have for you this week. What do you think? Do you think Betty and Barney Hill were telling the truth? Were they abducted and tested on? Or do you think the whole thing was an elaborate fiction? Let me know what you think by sending me an email to sywmtbpod at gmail.com. 
If you like this episode, don't forget to check out my Patreon page. The link is in the show notes. You can also follow me on social media. You can like me on Facebook. My page is titled So You Want Me to Believe Podcast. And you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. My handle is at SYWMTBpod on both platforms. And if you did like the show, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Good ratings help others find the show, and they make me feel good inside. And if you didn't like the show, keep it to yourself, but thanks for listening to the whole thing anyway. So that's all I have for you this week. Thank you for listening, and I will see you all again next week. 